I'm sorry. Uh, are we ready back there? Oh, sorry. Yes, we, we are. are. We are. We're ready. You're on. All right. <laughs> Should I flip to this one? Hello, my name is Dan Newman. I'm a cloud architect for Verizon Internal IT, responsible for uh, designing and implementing the internal IT infrastructure cloud. And uh, I'm Fred Oliveira. Do you want to flip to the next slide? Yeah. Fred Oliveira. Uh, I'm also an architect uh, working in the uh, cloud architecture, uh, and particularly more on the uh, network side of the house. And uh, we're uh, kind of jointly going to talk about what we've done and our different use cases and uh, uh, kind of the environment we're in. Um, so this is kind of just a short uh, agenda. We can probably go to the next thing. Uh, again, I think I can go. I have one. Uh, so uh, again, we're, we're just doing a, a very relatively simple uh, OpenStack environment. Uh, and uh, part of our goal is to uh, leverage uh, kind of the COTS hardware or separate the uh, hardware from the uh, software functions uh, and enable the addition of uh, different uh, services, different OpenStack services over time. Uh, one of our uh, uh, big, or big challenges is kind of how do we move into this framework uh, given our legacy uh, environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about our challenges as we go along. Uh, go this. You know, we have a uh, relatively simple, uh, again, uh, spine and leaf architecture. Uh, this is uh, kind of, a, again, another uh, small um, uh, transition from our environment. Um, part of our, uh, again, goal is to uh, deploy uh, SDN controllers to manage the, our, our data center fabrics. Uh, and this data center, uh, the SDN controller part is to uh, we want to extend from just managing the um, uh, internal data center fabric uh, and gradually move out farther and farther into the network uh, so that we can control the, uh, uh, the whole network. Uh, Verizon has a you know, kind of a several, uh, not interconnected networks, but uh, we, uh, uh, in order to bring all those networks into um, the environment, uh, we want to kind of bring everything into one place. Um, Part of, from the network perspective, we want to run uh, uh, services, uh, applications from um, all the business units. So we intend to run uh, wireline, telecom, uh, wireless uh, uh, business services applications all within the single cloud uh, environment. And uh, that brings with it a uh, kind of a, a mixed set of uh, challenges and uh, uh, will uh, get some more experience uh, over time. I, again, we expect this to be a fairly long journey. Um, we're deployed right now in a, a small number of data centers, uh, and over the next uh, uh, few months and years, uh, we'll deploy in several more uh, data centers and uh, gradually bring uh, applications into this uh, environment. Okay. <clears throat> From an IT perspective, we've been doing uh, IT automation in siloed compartments for quite a while. You know, everybody had their scripts and their, their tooling to do their jobs faster. And collectively, there wasn't really a lot of interaction between the siloed groups. So uh, from the standpoint of IT, we wanted to see how we could, you know, partner with the business and deliver business results. And from a business perspective, all the work we were doing in the siloed environments to kind of speed up what was going on from an IT perspective wasn't necessarily visible to the end users. Um, you know, I likened it to working days and days on, on the engine of a car, and uh, you know, it could go as fast as a Lamborghini, but if the outside looked like a Kia, everybody wondered what you were doing, right? So it, it really was that end result that everybody was looking for. So we realized that all the work we were doing to, to speed up and, and really just do IT automation was great, but it wasn't necessarily fitting to the end, right? The, the business users didn't actually see that, that value uh, directly. So when we looked at OpenStack, one of the reasons why we went towards the OpenStack uh, environment was to start with you know, a common set of programmatic APIs to get a programmatic infrastructure so that we could expose it to our development partners. We, we really went down the road of DevOps and we wanted to partner with them tightly so that all the automation we were doing was starting, you know, the foundation for that end result that we were trying to achieve. 
So we want a tight integration with the CI CD tool chain. And so to get that moving and to really kickstart that, we uh, recognized that an organizational change was needed. So we took a group of developers and defined a DevOps platform engineering team to focus on the CI CD tool chain aspects of the uh, environment to really start to put together that automated agile development framework that would take advantage of the programmatic infrastructure that we were building. And when we wanted to make sure that this would be uh, a very transformational effort, we didn't want to go and you know, recycle the things that we've done in the past simply to get you know, a little bit of movement in the infrastructure side, but we really wanted to reach that business objective. So this next gen platform, we, we had some principles that we wanted to kind of drive home with the developers, with the business unit saying, you know, I think you've all heard the cattle versus pets analogy, and we really wanted this platform to be more cattle, where, where it was an automated perspective that we weren't building assets in this environment that were gonna be cared for and managed in the traditional legacy model, but that we were really gonna push for more of a cloud native methodology. We didn't want any software agents to run in the, in the environment. You know, we, we've been there, done that. Uh, the dynamic capabilities, the dynamic scaling, it would slow things down, you know, having agents to be reset, to connect. Um, you know, it, it was a total change in mindset. You know, from an asset management perspective, something could be there now, it could be gone in a minute, and an agent might not even connect by then. So we, we really wanted to transform everything, not just the infrastructure, but we recognized the holistic environment had to start to change. Um, you know, trying to get away from the concept of going in and making manual changes so that you know, you had to test and manage your code so that when it went into production, you didn't have to log into a box and make manual changes. You know, try to really harden the fact that, you know, the dev test process and that tool chain needs to be where everything happens. So by kind of going into that framework and changing the methodology and the model and, and from an infrastructure perspective, it was pretty difficult because we'd always been held to Harden that, harden that infrastructure, harden the hardware. I mean, make sure that there's nothing gonna go wrong in your environment, that a developer can take the assumption that if I run something there, oh, oops, great. If the infrastructure's not gonna go away like this, <laughs> <laughs> and that the, and, and, uh, they could rely on the underlying infrastructure to provide high availability uh, to a certain degree. We wanted to really push more for uh, horizontally scaling, 12-factor uh, application methodology, and, and it was very important that they understood that that's what we were trying to accomplish here and, and not try to shove legacy applications in here and, and not get the results that we were trying to get. So during this process, you know, there were a couple things from an IT perspective that we learned um, that was very uh, transformational from the aspect of the folks who were involved in the project as well as uh, the enterprise in large. Um, infrastructure teams had to learn how to become service providers. They were no longer you know, in a siloed model where I just support this box, I don't know what it's doing, I don't know how it's being used, but this is what I do and this is why I do it. Uh, they had to understand that they were providing a service to an end user, our development and business units, and they had to understand how they wanted to be able to use that product you were providing. So there had to be a greater partnership on how that service was developed, how it was maintained and how it was delivered. Uh, one of the first things we did before we start to automate this end-to-end -end process is to, to understand what are the processes, not just for acquiring the hardware, deploying the hardware, but also the processes around an end user coming in to request hardware, right? When we started to workflow all the processes out, it was surprising to find out how many things were done just because that's how they always did it. And by streamlining the process, questioning everything about the process, you were able to automate smaller tasks, execute tasks faster, and get people what they needed on demand. And uh, that, that was huge. Uh, the fail fast culture shift, you know, there, there's, there, there was always this long stream of testing and evaluation before anything could hit the floor, and it would take months to get anything new out. Uh, I think getting everybody to understand that not only to be agile at the business level, but agile at the infrastructure level, to test things out, to take risks. I mean, that's really what we wanted this environment to be. You know, we understood that, you know, OpenStack's maturing, the, the, the tooling is maturing, and, and we had to go into that knowing it's not gonna be perfect, because if we waited for it to be perfect, we'd never deploy. 
Um, and then again, from an automation perspective, making sure that we followed the standards, that we leveraged standard APIs, that we weren't developing a lot of custom API code that we'd have to maintain and do regression testing for. So there was, it was really huge to you know, uh, leverage and consume you know, standard APIs so that you could write once, use many. Uh, communication was huge, right? Uh, there was a lot of concern over you know, what does this mean? How do I get involved? Especially the, the uh, outline process. When you talk about operations, you talk about finance, you talk about, you know, the governance components, compliance, security. There were a lot of new areas. So as we began to automate, when we hit a bottleneck, because it was a manual process or there wasn't any tooling in place to automate that particular task, the spotlight kind of moved down the chain. And people started to realize, you know, two, three steps down the chain, where's the next bottleneck going to be and, and do I want to be there? And that really helped to get the process moving because as you automated it away, you, you would always evaluate where, where's the longest piece in this chain? Why does it you know, take four weeks when the automation here takes two hours, right? And so then you would start to shine that off and, and start to, to begin automating the process. So, so communicating out the whole effort so that you weren't necessarily boiling the ocean, but you were assigning service providers to even the business processes so that they could immediately begin to start looking at how can I make this process better? How can I automate this process so that when the bottleneck came to them, they already had a plan, they were kind of moving on it and, and uh, you know, making sure that they understood what the end result was and that the business objectives that we were trying to achieve was the end goal kept everybody on the same page. The training and transition was huge because when you start to move into this methodology, you have to understand how do I take the knowledge I have and how do I codify that? How do I fit into this new model? How can I understand how to be an evangelist for this and not fear that, you know, if you automate this, my job goes away. It's, if you automate this, I can go over here and do more uh, new tasks. I can build new services. I can manage the roadmap for this service. It's, it's having to understand what do I do today and how does it fit in the world of tomorrow? Um, and again, know your user stories. Um, I, I don't know how many times we've delivered services and the end user said, you've got 20% of what I need, not good enough, so I'm going over here. You have to understand what you're building, why you're building it, have a roadmap where you can collaborate with your end users to understand where you are, where you're going. And so a 20% success story is, is not seen as a failure but as a move in the right direction. Because a lot of times it's easy to say, if you don't have everything I need, you didn't deliver me anything. So we have to partner and understand that it's a growth process and together we can mature it. And that's kind of um, very important when defining user stories and identifying and um, placing the uh, importance on where to start with your roadmaps. Uh, monitoring, that was huge. This was a new environment. A lot of open source components were integrated. A lot of uh, knowledge needed to be gathered and where to look, where are the problems happening, what problems are happening, and what do I do when I see those? And as we matured and building the monitoring platform and building the, the items to monitor and uh, find out what the recovery process was for a lot of these things, we were able to start building self-healing. And the stability in the platform started to grow as our monitoring got better. So it, it was really important to get some real world experience with failures and, and troubleshooting and, and identifying the issues that we started to see in our particular environment with the tool sets that we've had. And, and it just, it takes time for that to happen. Uh, I, I would wish there was just a, a quick template that just came out and said, here's all the things you look for, here's where you look for it, and here's how you make it stable. But we found that it grows over time. So that's something that uh, we placed a lot of importance on and, and anytime anybody sees anything or has to do anything, we have to track it, we have to monitor it, we have to make sure that uh, if there's a way that we can create some self-healing uh, actions to take, that we do that, and, and it really helps with the stability of the platform. And, and again, adoption is about the end-to-end -end automation. Within IT and in, in the legacy application space, we've had a lot of automation and, and workflow scripts, but if you have a button that says, push this and I get a VM, but you have to go through you know, five weeks of business process to request it, to validate it, to fund it, to approve it before you hit the button. That two hours is just a, a, a spec in the seven to eight weeks to get anything. So end-to-end -end automation is really key to adoption. 
especially when you talk about CI/CD toolchain, the the base infrastructure integration with the CI/CD toolchain is only a piece of it. Change management automation, security validation. I mean, so you know, OpenStack is the foundation for what we're trying to deliver. But the end result that, from an IT perspective, we want to see the businesses see value in that and and automation, so that they can be more agile in delivering services to their end users. And you know, we see OpenStack as a very good partner in that foundational piece of delivering a higher level business objective. All right, I'll turn it over to Fred. Uh, Um, so in the network space, uh, where we don't actually develop uh, most of our applications, we actually get them from uh, our vendors. Uh, so it, part of the issue is how to get these applications uh, into a, a cloud environment. Uh, a lot of these applications were not written for this uh, environment. So we're having to work through, um, uh, for each application that we, need to, uh, that we get, uh, work with the vendor, uh, work with our platform engineering team, uh, uh, incrementally tune the environment to adapt to this, uh, uh, each VNF to the environment. Uh, and this led us, we actually have to uh, provide a, uh, a lab environment uh, within various locations uh, of Verizon, and we're working actually with some of our vendors directly that they are deploying uh, the, uh, a mini version of what we're deploying in the field uh, in their lab so that they can uh, validate this environment. Uh, so. Again, because these things were not necessarily meant for the cloud, uh, some of the issues we're seeing is that the uh, you know, dynamic scaling uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, they're tuned for uh, a fixed set of uh, services if they're providing a spe specific service. Uh, and there's uh, things like load balancing don't work very well. Uh, they have, again, because they're not meant to scale in and out, uh, they don't have uh, some of the load balancing built in. And then one of the key, or kind of issues we found in, as we started to deploy some of these applications were that the licensing models that we're getting from our vendors are, are uh, more targeted at the kind of legacy environment where you're buying a fixed set of resources uh, and you're deploying them up front uh, and then uh, kind of paying that same cost forever. Uh, one of the things we were looking for in this uh, cloud environment is that there is an ability to run uh, kind of dynamic scaling, uh, not uh, have the full uh, capacity available from every service all the time, uh, that we would scale capacity as the, uh, uh, the demand and the customers demanded it. Uh, so this is kind of something we're working through with our vendors as to you know, what is the licensing model, how do you deploy applications uh, on this infrastructure and uh, work with it. Uh, and again, as I think as Dan mentioned, one of the kind of the key points in this is really is you know, day two through N, uh, how do you keep this working? Um, how do you upgrade it? Uh, how do you integrate with the uh, existing management tools, uh, existing service assurance tools? Uh, there's a, a bunch of uh, pieces missing uh, from the current, both from uh, the uh, platform level in OpenStack as well as uh, from the VNFs. Uh, when you introduce an, an extra level of abstraction through virtualization, uh, you've now lost control of uh, where things actually sit uh, there is uh, some of our uh, inventory systems expect things to be uh, a particular application to sit on the same server forever. Um, and that isn't necessarily true in a cloud environment. Uh, again, service orchestration, automation is probably key to uh, achieving any operational long-term operational uh, advantage. Uh, we really need to uh, uh, improve automation both from a kind of deployment and uh, resiliency perspective. Uh, and so there was some of the issues we found uh, in this space that there isn't any common way to do uh, orchestration of these uh, environments. Uh, the uh, APIs uh, of the uh, applications themselves, uh, as well as the uh, infrastructure, uh, platform app for infrastructure, doesn't really have a, a, a visible or well-defined information model that we could consume uh, and uh, enable through an environment. Uh, because we're deploying uh, applications from several vendors, uh, historically these vendors have delivered um, kind of a, a full stack of functionality, uh, including hardware, all the software, 
uh, all the orchestration pieces as a single unit. Uh, we end up with having um, several orchestrators uh, built up into this uh, environment. Uh, and they don't necessarily uh, cooperate. Uh, they don't, uh, they kind of, in the way they're uh, designed and what they expect, they, they don't, uh, they expect that they own all the infrastructure. Uh, this again introduces some issues for us because the, uh, we are running multiple applications on the same infrastructure uh, and the orchestrators uh, really need to be uh, talking to each other, um, coordinating issues, uh, or at least be tolerant of uh, the kind of resource exha exhaustion from any one particular place where there's uh, um, kind of multiple uh, services that, uh, asking for resources in the environment. Uh, will that work? Yes. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, as Dan was describing, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, kind of our challenges are how do we actually bring this into the environment? Uh, our uh, application teams are uh, not used to this. They're used to getting a, a kind of a full application suite uh, from a vendor and deploying that uh, in a separate space uh, without any kind of uh, shared resources. Uh, and now that there's a kind of a, a software only um, uh, release, uh, these re uh, release cycles are getting um, kind of shorter uh, and dealing with this as a um, uh, upgrading these things uh, relatively quickly without having to spend six months uh, qualifying the individual uh, environment. Um, oops, did I go uh, Is uh, kind of a, problem that we're having to deal with um, and kind of trying to get these out uh, incrementally is uh, one of our you know, desired goals to get into a more of a kind of a, uh, I'll say a cloud ops, DevOps model uh, and managing this uh, is, becomes an issue. Uh, again, from a kind of a network perspective, uh, our, what we generally, you know, what Verizon provides is kind of the best service uh, and in order to accomplish that, we are work with our vendors to uh, work on an SLA environment. Uh, in order to provide uh, kind of an, an SLA from their application, uh, running on kind of a commodity shared infrastructure, uh, there is kind of a gap in how they achieve that. Uh, there is no way to quantify uh, exactly how their uh, application is going to work in a shared environment. Uh, there is uh, kind of they need a way themselves to get uh, some assurance uh, that they're going to get the, uh, the capabilities, all the resources that they've asked for, uh, and that they need a way to measure that they, you know, from the platform perspective, the platform hasn't broken the SLA that it's promised for that uh, service. And again, from, a, uh, from the platform perspective itself, uh, we're uh, developing this uh, kind of as a, from multiple vendors. Uh, OpenStack uh, generally doesn't, because we're buying hardware separately from uh, the OpenStack environment from various components in there, uh, the platform team now becomes somewhat of an integrator. Uh, and this is, again, is just somewhat of a change for um, the Verizon team. How do you, um, with different release cycles of uh, OpenStack versus the, uh, an SDN controller versus the orchestrator, uh, how do you manage these release cycles? Um, currently, OpenStack doesn't do a very clean uh, upgrade or non-disruptive upgrade without uh, having some hiccups in the environment. Uh, so that's kind of some of the challenge that we have from uh, we're asking for OpenStack to improve is the uh, kind of uh, upgradability and uh, dealing with this. Uh, but this, this is kind of our uh, existing challenges. How, how do we run this uh, from you know, day end? Um, I think we just go on. Uh, just some of the issues that we found in uh, kind of OpenStack environment itself. Uh, just from uh, some of the things that we're can experiencing more is things like the uh, uh, security issues. Uh, having a um, uh, an OpenStack environment that uh, sits underneath all these applications uh, does, by its nature, expose a uh, slightly larger attack service. Uh, if you can get into the OpenStack environment uh, and uh, control some of the controller aspects, you can uh, uh, have access to all of the VNFs that are in the environment. Uh, 
Uh, and so this is one of these where uh, we need to harden uh, all aspects of the uh, uh, OpenStack uh, authentication, uh, OpenStack access, uh, and all those services as well. Uh, from, uh, because of our, again, our nature is, uh, we're looking to deliver mostly network services uh, from um, you know, my side of the house. And one of the big gaps we see in uh, OpenStack today is that there's uh, not a well-defined uh, metric for, or API to manage the uh, uh, quality of service that we're getting across the network, uh, as well as across all the IO environments. Uh, and we're looking for uh, a way to get this. Uh, there's currently no, um, uh, that's in various processes in the latest version that's improving, uh, but we need to uh, uh, kind of enhance all that environment. Uh, and then again, uh, kind of the orchestrator problem I talked about before. Uh, I believe that's uh, it for things. Um, I think we're done. Uh, we're willing to take questions if there's anybody that uh, has questions uh, and anything can do for you. Thank you all for coming. I was, I was uh, wondering if you guys could spend a little bit more time talking about uh, the business requirements that you were trying to address. And uh, if, sorry, I assume a big part of that's financial, where, where the analysis sits and when you expect to see more gains than mm -hmm. investment. Yeah, I, and I, I certainly is financial. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, I think it's a fallacy to expect that you'll get immediate um, uh, cost savings. I, I think there's a, uh, actually an increase uh, in cost uh, in the near term uh, because you're uh, deploying a new environment uh, and exposing uh, another set of operational tools and training into this environment. Uh, in, uh, I think one of our bigger gains is uh, pace of uh, deploying functions, deploying applications, uh, the ability to, um, oh, just went out. okay, um, uh, enable, capabilities there, uh, and uh, um, operational efficiency will be our kind of, uh, I think, long-term gain and, and deployments of uh, applications. Dan, anything else? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's business agility is a, is a lot of it. I mean, if you look at the, you know, the public cloud space and, and the cost model for that, a lot of the reasons are business agility, shadow IT. You know, that's one of the main reasons I think OpenStack has, has really kicked off because you know, we're trying to get that same level of functionality internally to deliver that business agility and, and, and to cut the costs and, you know, kind of bring as much of that uh, uh, cost down to provide the end goals, the business results. Hey, let's do something there. Hey, thank you very much. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, challenges you may have faced around um, security and their take on your journey um, in how you maybe had to transform or evolve um, mm -hmm. from where you were to meet the gaps of the challenges of uh, this journey for you guys. Yeah, uh, well I have some, I think Dan has some. So uh, I think we certainly had challenges in uh, kind of many directions. Um, uh, because we were uh, deploying kind of dynamic services into um, kind of various network uh, topologies, uh, our, our kind of normal path for this is to basically file, uh, you know, uh, tickets for enabling firewall rules, enabling uh, access to different networks. Uh, this is a challenge for us, and currently, uh, how do you uh, trust that the automation uh, tools will actually do the correct operations? Um, so it's kind of just the firewall rules, access to the networks was, uh, is kind of a big challenge itself uh, from the outside world. Uh, inside, uh, it, you know, some of the challenges we're faced uh, are things like uh, Keystone um, as a kind of authentication model and a role-based uh, model uh, doesn't, uh, or it's kind of in the version we're using, doesn't really have uh, uh, hierarchical uh, roles. Uh, and so you end up in this uh, kind of, there's a single administrator perspective. Um, that's caused, again, some of our issues of uh, who has access or who has control of the uh, infrastructure. Um, those are kind of the major security challenges we ran across. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we talk about the spotlight moving, you know, when you get that automation and somebody can hit a button in the self-service, you know, you have to have a way of automating your compliance, your auditing, 
you know, make sure your access and your authorization rules are in place. Audit trails exist, isolation exists. Um, so you know, a lot of that is uh, a constant work in progress. It's an educational uh, exercise. Uh, so you, you, know, you start with smaller pockets and you grow, but uh, you know, as Fred said, there's a lot of uh, legacy security requirements that have to you know, fit into this, uh, whether that's putting open LDAP in front of multiple open source products so that you get you know, a federated access methodology for some of the open source products that don't support multi um, US, uh, multi AD support, things of that nature. So, you know, everything is going to happen overnight, but I think everybody understanding where we're trying to get and, and kind of feeding that back into the community is, is something that, you know, hopefully will grow and mature as, as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for uh, sharing insights uh, with us. So, I have a question about uh, like, uh, uh, you have faced the problem with the dynamic scaling with the root balancers. Mm -hmm. So can you explain more about it? Uh, I think this, well, I'll explain my side. Uh, the um, uh, kind of challenge we have is more from uh, uh, our way the applications were initially designed. Uh, again, they're designed internally for a specific service level, uh, and they weren't designed to scale out automatically. Uh, I think the, the tools are there, uh, at least with things like LBAS 2.0, um, to do that functionality. Uh, but the, the uh, VNFs we have and the uh, orchestration that was available uh, didn't leverage that capability, so we didn't, couldn't leverage that. Uh, you anything from a dynamic scaling dynamic, perspective? Dynamic scaling perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, again, the application's key, right? The application needs to support it. Uh, the KPIs that you're leveraging and where those exist and how those events get, get triggered um, and you know that's why if you're talking legacy, it's a, it's a different game to uh, enable any kind of uh, dynamic scaling in the sense that you know sometimes they want to go up and down with modifications of existing VMs. Uh, but in the next gen space, what we want to do is make sure that any of the asset management tracking, the security rules, the the replication of the application, it really relies on that CI/CD tool chain, right? So if you if you don't get all of the components both from a governance and operational perspective and the application together to be automated dynamically, if any one of those doesn't work, the dynamic capabilities go away, which is why we, we you know, I said earlier about the agent list, because the, the whole concept of having an agent go register and catch up when, you know, that, that dynamic scaling methodology could happen in seconds up and down if you don't tune it right. But, um, you know, th those are some of the things that, to really look at is you need that end-to-end -end automation for dynamic scaling to truly work. All right, thanks. Yeah, I guess one more there. Okay, yeah. sure. I had a question about um, some of the challenges you had. You talked about um, networking, uh, orchestration, and, and um, security mm -hmm. as some of the challenges you had. You talked sort of around the things that the OpenStack community needed to resolve. It, does your team perform any um, improvements and pass those improvements back yeah. to the community? And um, you know, what does that process look like? Sure, well, and I think there's probably two sides. Uh, uh, so in our current path, uh, we're, uh, we uh, don't do our own development in the network side of the house. We're dependent on our uh, vendors to provide that. Uh, some of the challenges we found, particularly in OpenStack, were some of the integration issues we had with uh, our hardware and our SDN controller, um, most from uh, kind of a deployment and uh, uh, upgrade perspective. Uh, those challenges were basically not really OpenStack per se related, more from the distribution uh, related. Um, from a kind of OpenStack in general, I think there's more the uh, high packet rate um, uh, processing. Uh, I think that is being addressed in things like the uh, DPDK enabled OVS uh, uh, improve that. Uh, and that's some of the things we're about to deploy is the, uh, that, that kind of functionality. But uh, our Kind of process is to work with our vendors, uh, uh, work with the issue, find out what the issue is. They would, our vendors would then uh, propose a uh, uh, a solution, uh, provide us with you know a short-term solution, and then push all that uh, uh, solutions upstream, and then eventually come downstream. When you mention um, vendors, are you referring to the um, company that uh, maintains the distribution? Yes, uh, and I, I think you may have heard we made a. Um, a Press release. We're using Red Hat okay. uh, for that uh, distribution and uh, Big Switch for the uh, uh, SDN controller. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Yep. Hi, quick, quick question. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about the financial implications here as one of the drivers, mm -hmm. and you focused a lot on automation and, and scheduling of those systems, and as well as looking at OpenStack or your virtualization environment mm -hmm. as well as delivery tools. But do you think you can do today, get a lot of those gains just by automating a lot of your process and mm -hmm. using virtualization as another tool, but not the end all be all? So uh, I have, so in, in, in um, the near term, yes. Uh, I think there's uh, significant gains that are possible just by automating some of our manual processes. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult in the current environment because we're, uh, we tend to buy uh, kind of a, a, a vertical silo for a particular application. Uh, so there's like, we can't share resources between those things. Uh, uh, there may be you know, a whole or a number of racks that are idle for one application uh, that we can't leverage for another application just because they're kind of sitting in silos. Uh, but yet, it, certainly there's uh, opportunity uh, just doing automation, uh, orchestration environments, and, and leveraging some of those capabilities. Uh, and, and we are doing that uh, simultaneously. And, and again, OpenStack, I agree with you, is just a tool. Uh, and virtualization in general is just another tool to fit into that uh, toolkit. Any more yeah, and just flip it upside down, right? Uh, you know, when we started, virtualization was the speed. The process was the bottleneck in the virtual space. If you flip it upside down and you look at everything outside of virtualization where we haven't done the end-to-end the -end bare metal provisioning per se, or as Fred mentioned, some of the siloed components, if they can take advantage of the automated business and financial processes up front, that becomes the small part, this becomes the larger part, and it'll probably help to drive this because this will get the spotlight and they'll say, why can't you get virtual, right? Or you know, how can we speed whatever you are doing up? And, and, and I, I, I think the value is, is just gonna be tremendous once you know, we crack that and, and it starts to work for everything, right? IT as a service, not necessarily just virtualization, correct? And just one follow-up question on that. In terms of, we talked a lot about hypervisors and optimizing hypervisors, mm -hmm. DPDK and SRV, but are you looking to use more of a bare metal approach or containerized mm -hmm. approach to get more efficiency out of the systems versus having to do the heavy lifting or trying to integrate through or make Swiss mm -hmm. cheese out of hypervisors to get performance? Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, again, from the network side of the house, we're, again, dependent on our vendors to actually do that. We are encouraging our vendors to, and, and, and not net, so containers are a solution. Uh, and uh, here I'll say cloudification is probably the more um, uh, direct path, and, and however it's actually implemented is uh, up to them. Um, we're asking our vendors to make their uh, applications be much more dynamic, uh, separated out into much more smaller services uh, that can be individually scaled, individually deployed, up, individually upgraded, uh, and operate them as a kind of, again, the classical microservice. From a kind of container perspective, uh, we uh, again see containers as a kind of a, another virtualization method. Uh, it, uh, in certain circumstances, does remove uh, kind of a level of indirection through an, another guest OS. Uh, so it, it all depends on what's suitable for that uh, various applications. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a it's a service level discussion, right? As as the services mature and the reference architecture to deliver those services mature, then those decisions can start to get made. Uh, and you know, from a container perspective, depending on what those service requirements are, you know, if you've got a, a enough demand for that service to justify the dedicating, uh, you know, resource pools to deliver that, you know, at a lower latency. Uh, not making Swiss cheese, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the service and, you know, its requirements, but yes. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's it. Uh, again, thank you very much for uh, attending and uh, we'll talk about Thank you. <laughs>